King of Podcasts Radio Network proudly presents the Wrestling Is Real Podcast because wrestling needs us. Another Wrestling Is Real Podcast is here and just in time for a really busy news cycle in WWE. We're going to talk all about that because, yeah, let's not talk about Double or Nothing this weekend. Let's go and get overshadowed by freaking news coverage of WWE this weekend. Might as well go and do that, right? Anyway, let's go ahead and talk about it. King of Podcast here with you. Thanks for being here. Laying down what everything's going on right now. First of all, we know of a change in the lead announcer at Monday Night Raw. Adnan Verk is out, replaced with Jimmy Smith. We'll talk all about that. AEW, what was it, last week or the week before, decided to go ahead and make announcements of going back on tour with live shows. And now WWE has done the same. We'll talk about that. And then we also have the issues when it comes to some big corporate changes going on at Titan Towers and the obvious influence of Nick Khan and the types that are there. And and some of the modus operandi that's going on with all of this, we'll talk about that, which has to be done because even though there might be good and bad going on with the company in terms of how things are going right now, we have to go and talk about all the things that are going on with this company, which is very much in flux. It's volatile at best right now in the corporate structure. And a lot of reasons is because of the broadcast partners and because of the influence of Nick Khan. We can tell this is actually happening. And I believe what's happening overall before I get into all the news is the fact that I think Nick Khan is trying to go ahead and alleviate some of the problems that are going on right now when it comes to the main product. Let's start with things we could probably be able to do some cosmetic changes to to make it a little bit better for the shows. And this is what I think the thought process is. Well, we cannot go right to Vince right away and say, Vince, you know, shareholders, they're upset. The show's just not getting any better. The copy and paste type booking, the same people on on Raw every week. SmackDown's a bit better, but overall, both shows could really use an overhaul. And I think there's just some changes that need to happen in terms of who is in control of the books. And I think that's what we've got to go and work on right now. So I agree with all that, and I think there's a way to go ahead and make that happen where Vince will eventually have to see the light. But I think Nick Khan is going through the approach of just trying to take Vince at his word and say, listen, you know, maybe there's something else that we can fix before we have to go and fix this. Before the overall, you know, maybe Vince is giving the excuses to say, well, it's nothing to do with, you know, me and Bruce or Kevin Dunn and the rest of the crew here. We've been doing what we've been doing for years. It's, it's everything else. It's the changing technology around us. It's the people around us is changing. Okay. So let's fix it, Vince, Nick says. And he starts doing some things to change. One of the things, the initial changes came after WrestleMania. We see that now. And it's all making sense based on what we're hearing from Dave Meltzer and, you know, Jason Powell and uh, Mike Johnson and all these different wrestling writers. We're all learning about the fact that some of the changes instituted right now after WrestleMania, specifically the announcer booths, by having Michael Cole work with Pat McAfee, who has a good sports background, a lot when it comes to sports and just the presentation. And then adding Adnan Verk over to the Raw team to be lead announcer, replacing Tom Phillips. Now, overall, I understand the moves. And I think before we get into why, these moves work and what the the thought process going on right now from this sports minded top talent agent individual who has worked with the biggest names in sports television. He is putting his footprint down in a good way. I like what he's trying to do. And I think what he's trying to do is the right thing to do when it comes to getting the product in its right way and trying to get it where it can be better. And I do believe he's doing that right now with some of the changes he has instituted. Pat McAfee, to me, has been a win overall. I think he, Pat McAfee's added to the show. I think him and Michael Cole 
actually bounce off each other really well. This show is about as in the presentation. Pat McAfee, I think he feels really comfortable right now. I, and you could tell he's hungry. He wants to make sure he's doing well with what he's doing here. And I can appreciate where he's trying to go with it. And the approach, his knowledge of the product, his excitement, his energy level, it's working. I like what he's doing. So that was a good change. Now, as for Adnan Verk, he's a guy, the Nick Cons of the world is thinking, listen, this guy, this is where this whole wrestling-centric concept is where Nick Khan is trying to fight against the narrative of saying, well, we can't just keep going this route and saying that we have to do the things the way the wrestling booking has been done for years. We have to do it a certain style. And I really think that Nick Khan's trying to modernize the format. He wants to bring what he delivered as deals to Fox and USA. But especially with Fox, he wants to create much more of a sports feel. And they've been doing some of that. But there's still that attitude era, ruthless aggression era layover that is still stuck with us. And some of the habitual things that continue to happen on these shows, which might have been okay because things were going so well, but now feel dated and old and to get the major changes needed to get to that point it's going to take a little while nick khan has obviously earned a lot of capital in terms of being able to get some credibility for himself and saying if he wanted to make changes this guy is making changes that are good i mean this is what i'm going to say for first and foremost what nick khan is trying to do is very well intentioned and it's smart now, this is not what wrestling fans are going to believe, but I feel like what he's trying to do was a good attempt. When it comes to Pat McAfee, that experiment is working. And Pat McAfee, as far as I'm concerned, that guy is a good spot as color commentator. He's going to fit in there well. And Corey Graves isn't so bad, but I think Pat McAfee actually over overpowers what he's doing. And I think on SmackDown, Pat, Pat, Pat McAfee actually fits a good role. And the best part is they're also doing other things. So Pat McAfee has a good exposure through his own radio show and through other things he can do and just doing this Friday night thing, which is good. And the fact that Nick Khan is making sure these guys are not being held exclusively and being held down. Now, that might change down the line based on the live shows, based on the things they might have to do. But because they're going to eventually have the pay-per-views are going to have to go travel. And then the travel schedule will be coming up for them. So there'll be more dates and there'll probably be more time. They'll be spent going out to do things with Adnan Verk. His, he's got a good voice. He's sports minded. He's not bad with quips, but the overarching issue is that he, he can't call the moves. He doesn't have enough of the knowledge of the stars and any background to go off of to really work. But, I don't think that Nick Khan's worrying about that. I don't think because to, to really to narrow cast the amount of people that could go ahead and be lead announcers or to be on a program, the idea is Adnan Verk could be an announcer doing other things. So at ESPN, he doesn't have to be behind the, the uh, at the anchor desk. He could be out and doing commentary, play-by-play play if he wanted to, somewhere else. And he could do that down the line if he wanted to. It's not like he wasn't capable. He did events, and he's okay. But for what WWE wants, they want to be able to have that universe. They want to have the moves, making sure the moves are called properly. It's not as if the moves are important in the eyes of WWE all the time. But it's not like they're going to call move after move. But enough to be kind of into the wrestling commentary to be the play-by-play and being that part and not just being another analyst, much like Corey Graves and Byron Saxon, and then Corey Graves and Byron Saxon having to go and play a little bit of catch-up for him. He wasn't as... I, I just felt he blended in, and I really don't care about the announcers giving me the moves because that's not a show. Raw, even with Tom Phillips so much, or, you know, I, I mean, Vic Joseph does kind of go, like, talking move after move, sure, Michael Cole does somewhat, but for me, it doesn't make a difference because that's not, their programming doesn't 
make me feel like I have to go and hear the move sets from them. If it's Excalibur doing an AEW, absolutely, because I think he does a really good job of that. His delivery is wonderful. He's very good, very good. With Ross and Shivani, that's a very good team together. I I really enjoy the announced team on AEW. MLW, same way, and they've changed up who the announcers are now, and that's been fine. And Ring of Honor, it's fine with Rick Abani, sure. I just don't like the kind of pushed on type of commentary that he does. It's a, uh, it's not as over the top as Kevin Kelly, but you know, it's just a little bit different now. Let's get into the real run through of everything right now that we have with Adnan Verk. So first of all, his departure was announced a couple days ago and he's out. Okay. And there's a whole lot to be said about the new announcer, Jimmy Smith. We'll talk about that in a minute. So Adnan Verk, let's go and talk about him on the outs. So he is no longer working for WWE and the company called it a mutual departure. Amicable, if you will. Fightful Select reported that the company was hoping to make it amicable as both sides were very aware that the situation wasn't working out and it appeared they knew it early on. Now, we also know that WWE was already going to plan to make the move regardless and made up their mind even before Monday Night Raw this week. And that made it where Virk's last TV appearance with the company was this Monday. Now, Adnan Virk is not going to be losing anything at all. He still does the MLB Network Studio show, Change Up, and also does commentary and works for The Zone, the subscription streaming service for MMA and boxing and a lot of other things over there. So he's fine. He'll do okay. Just for him, listen, he's an ESPN voice. He can go wherever he wants. He has a lot of other places to go. Is that WWE was not the right place for him, and that's okay. That's not a problem. Let's move along. Let's go and talk about Jimmy Smith. There's a lot... There's quite a resume and track record that Jimmy Smith has. Now, he has been an analyst on NXT doing uh, the pre-shows. And another person that I'm sure that Nick Khan has probably as is represented in the past. And that's why him or Pat McAfee or Adnan Verk have been brought on board. Because obviously there must be some personal relationship, some personal professional relationship that Nick Khan has had with these gentlemen to bring them on board. And, you know, the integrity of the fact that Nick Khan was able to go and make the deals, you know, regardless of what you think of wrestling, I think Nick Khan is trying really hard to break the stereotype because I think he wants to legitimize wrestling as much as possible and give the product credibility. I mean, a brand like WWE already has that high exposure brand. They are very noticeable they they are representative of what wrestling is to mainstream america mainstream over around the world we already know that that's always been reported that is known as fact now jimmy smith does the fact that wwe is able to get gentlemen like these they're getting quality people to come on board and work that's not the question here at all so jimmy smith Hasn't been involved in MMA. He's worked at Bellator. He's worked in UFC. He also hosted American Ninja Warrior, covered since 2007. So that guy's been around, and he's very good. He's still relatively young as well. He's very good. I like how he works. So he got himself a little bit incorporated. Obviously, Jimmy Smith was going to get incorporated somehow, some way into the mix, because why not? And he can also do other things besides. So the announcement has been made that Jimmy Smith will debut as a playboy place, play by play voice for Monday Night Raw coming up Memorial Day this Monday. And Smith has served as an analyst for NXT hosting take NXT takeover pre-show panels and working on special projects. He's also the daily host of Sirius XM's Unlocking the Cage and was the host of American Warrior, American Ninja Warrior on G4. 
and he will be joined with Byron Saxon and Corey Graves for Monday Night Raw going forward. He wrote back and made his point and said, I know I'm stepping into the world. I was a Mr. Perfect Bruiser Brody fanatic, however, but I know I'll know I'll do everything I can do to honor the athletes and fans. Watch Monday and judge my work for yourself. I'm excited for this guy because I think th- this is one of the things you got to think about as well. When it comes to broadcasting, when you're going to replace, you're going to make some major changes to the product. You do some things to kind of where when you're going to make kind of an extreme change. Tom Phillips, who has been in the was in the WWE system through NXT and basically was trained for the ground up to work in WWE, right? And had several stints on Raw, several stints on NXT, and for whatever reason is no longer with a, uh, with a WWE in any way or shape or form. And then to go ahead and make the change. Adnan Verk would have not been the first choice, but I think they might have brought him out see what happens. But my guess is Nick Khan, you know, let's see if Adnan Verk will work out. And if it doesn't, he can be replaced. And I think Jimmy Smith might have been the ultimately the choice that we're going to go with anyway. But I think that Adnan Verk, in a way, give him the shot first. Might not have been the first choice, but might have been the choice they wanted to go with first based on what would happen. And then let's see what happens with Jimmy Smith later on, where they would put him in instead. But now, the pieces are falling where they are. Smith is a former MMA fighter. He went 5-1 in pro bouts between 2003 and 2006. And he has commented a lot. He was a host of Fight Quest on Discovery, worked as a host for American Ninja Warrior, commentated for Bellator MMA, bouts, premier boxing champions, the UFC, and more. And he will continue his daily MMA show on Sirius XM. So that guy is busy, and he's been working. Now, awfulnasty.com mentions that with Adnan Verk, Part of the challenges with getting Verk over with the audience came from him on such a high-profile show. After that, it seems logical for WWE to look at someone who's already known to at least a good portion of their audience. Calling play-by-play for Raw is still a big shift from hosting NXT pre-show panels, but Smith does have a fair bit of experience in combat sports generally and a bit of experience in WWE specifically. We'll see how he does. So I want to give him a chance, and I want to see what he's going to be able to do. Let's go a little more in depth into what Jimmy Smith offers to the table. From Bleacher Report. Well, he says the same thing, basically. Oh, uh, Dave Meltzer reported that Michael Cole, quote, has praised him heavily and found him to be very versatile. So with Jimmy Smith, Michael Cole is giving seal of approval. That means something for someone that's been there for so long. So if Michael Cole feels like that, he can sign off. And that's what has to happen, too, is that whoever comes to the announce desk, Michael Cole has to be able to sign off on the guy because he's worked with everybody else. You could tell the resonance that Michael Cole has given to everybody he's brought on. Like Vic Joseph is a copycat of Michael Cole, and that's fine. And he's, you know, Vic Joseph has found his own way, and he works effectively on NXT. And, you know, him on NXT is pretty good. I, I don't feel like there's much of a drop off at all even though more right now we all love but he's not here and with the changes being done we need to also talk about is the fact that wwe also made some changes when it came to digital they're, they're what they're doing right now in the digital division let's start and talk about that that comes from deadline.com this happened at the start of the week before everything else happened this week crazy so What's happening is this with the Peacock deal and with some of the things that that the company has been doing when it comes to not so much a merger, but the relationship they now have with NBC Universal, the overlap in the corporate sense, that's going to get cut out. Some of the the, the redundancy, the duplicitousness, no, no, not duplicitousness, the, the redundancy. The overlapping of jobs where people are doing the same jobs, but now that a new company is coming in, we're just going to use their resources instead of keeping ours. And that's the idea. So Mike Fleming at Deadline.com reports that 
WWE Studios sees layoffs as features, TV and digital divisions are consolidating. So, WWE Studios saw layoffs in features, TV, and digital social media divisions within their advanced media group. All these operations will be consolidated into one division with a smaller staff running those operations. And the news was conveyed today by President and Chief Revenue Officer Nick Khan. The features division productions range from the Hamish Grieve directed animated Rumble for Paramount Animation. The Dwayne Johnson Terror, Fighting With My Family, the movie that Dwayne Johnson uh, helped to produce. An upcoming multi-part documentary on the founder and chairman Vince McMahon being made for Netflix. And that's what they're going to be doing. So that's the plan. And we don't know what else they're going to be doing so far in terms of what other changes or what other um collapsing of what they're doing. Sure, this is not good. For some people, they're going to lose their jobs. But this company wants to be running smoothly. And I think with Nick Khan, this was this was part cost-cutting, but also restructuring. And any corporation is going to micromanage if they could do that. And that's part of the thing that I don't think that Maybe the uh, George Berrios and uh, I forget the other lady that was out there that, you know, those as presidents, they didn't want to make changes too. I just feel like Nick Khan has more of the feel of trying to just be, he's going to lead. He doesn't want to lead from, he doesn't want to just lead and follow. He wants to lead and he is making changes he thinks are good. And he's a, he's got a conviction on what he's trying to do. I don't feel like there's any changes that he's made. This this corporate thing, this sucks, but this was something that was going to happen. And I can accept the changes they're going to make on that end. Consolidating. That makes sense to me. Because they have relationships to work off of. They can outsource now. You can tell the difference in some of the graphics they're doing right now. When it comes to the live shows, it's different. And it's not bad. And it looks like that's what we're going to do. The other thing I noticed, too, is that I don't know if Raw was just the, this was just the reason he did it, but we saw a lot of production packages this week done pretty quick. And I don't know if that was something where it's another team that's coming in and it's not this other group, but everybody had a thing where we saw some little multi packages to kind of give us a catch up on the storylines leading up to the next copy and paste feud that we had at the same time slot as last week which has obviously affected the ratings overall. And let's just talk about those ratings right now because they set another new low in raw viewership. It, it just happens. What can I say? We're not even two months complete after WrestleMania. And the raw viewership, according to PW Torch, drew an average of 1.62 million viewers. Now, I don't think Jimmy Smith joining the announce desk is going to make much of a difference. Now, the show did have to go up against NHL and NBA playoff games. AEW Dynamite is preempted to Friday nights at 10 p.m. this weekend and next weekend. So we won't have Wednesday nights. So that's going to feel kind of weird. The ratings went out significantly bad. Ooh, not good at all. They lost more than a million viewers from last week. Here's what it looked like. Hour 1, 1.661. Hour 2, 1.665. Last week, they had 1.9 million in the 9 o'clock hour. 10 o'clock, 1.546. And that's a drop-off of nearly 200,000 viewers from last week. Now, we know it was on the show. It wasn't much better. It's continuing to be bad overall. It sucks. But what also has to be talked about, going back to the cuts and things that are going on, when the ratings are that bad, I feel like the company's making some changes, but then there's still going to be the oversight of some of the old guard with WWE in the first place. That's never going to go away yet. And here's what we have. So Kevin Dunn 
is now going to help oversee the division that has just been brought over to the combined departments, according to Mark Milton at Wrestling Inc. So the divisions will be overseen directly by Kevin Dunn, Executive Vice President of TV Production. Now, they've talked about a lot of people that were part of the production in, in this advanced media group division, which I'm not going to go and get into too much. But they made the changes that we're going to make. And there's no surprise with all that's going on here in the first place. What are you going to do? I don't like the moves either, but that's exactly what's going to happen. Now, we already knew beforehand that we were going to have some things like this happen coming up. You might remember about a month ago on this program, I talked about how Nick Khan had made your plans for the WWE. This was going back April 23rd. So this was shortly after WrestleMania. He was planning changes. Let's go back to that once again, just to make sure we know about the talent relations. So there have been some cosmetic changes, some significant changes being made. It's obvious that Nick Khan, first of all, is trying to structure the company. He is in including some people in his own circles as part of leadership. We know that he's also brought in some people that are part of who he's worked with in his relationships as an agent overseeing talent. So he's brought in talent. He's brought in leadership. And he is trying to make some changes now overall with who's coming on board. As we know, John Cohn, who's a longtime referee with WWE was brought into work in talent relations, talent relations, but then he was released as senior manager. And John Ornatus would now take control of the department once again. And that Cohen would go back to working as a referee. And there have been other changes before. Another referee who also worked in talent relations was also removed out of talent relations. And then you had in the communications department, Brian Flynn worked as chief marketing communications officer had been with the company for nine years after work with the NBA. And overall, the WWE communications department was undergoing a shakeup as Nick Khan was putting his people into power. And that there was also another person who worked at vice president of communications was also let go, was with the company for two years following a stint at A&E Networks. So Nick Khan is... Now coming in with his own people, because he wants the company to run, this is the idea. It's much like a network programmer. He's coming in bringing his people that he trusts to work well on television and running overall operations. These moves are understandable if you're going to have somebody run as this president and chief revenue officer. And as a chief revenue officer... You know, it's the overhead. It's cutting the bottom line. All the issues that might be coming in to make sure that you have the right people involved and that you have people that are going to be able to run certain divisions much better. Now, he can't get everybody in. John Lornat is working talent relations. Kevin Dunn overseeing operations on the production level. Vince still being involved in day-to-day creative. These are some of the bigger changes that eventually will have to happen. But he can't make those changes yet. There's only so much overhauling he's allowed to do right now. But he is starting to make the overhaul as we speak. And I will say, I think what he's doing is making sense. Also, there's another person that was released last month was Joe Villa. He was manager of publicity and corporate communications and was with the company for 22 years. So he is changing people out because these other people that were brought on board, you know, They were brought in under a different regime. They were brought in with the fact that their resumes might have said something, but they might not have been as effective or as efficient as possible. And the company's right now on a downswing, even though the new relationship with these broadcast partners are in place, the live shows are going to start coming back up again. To make sure everything is working right, Nick Khan is getting his people in play. And he is forming the organization as he needs to. The other thing that's got to be said is that this guy at CAA, CAA is an organization that's not so much, it's not so strictly corporate, but it is that it's a lean, mean machine. 
it's kind of the way I'd like to run companies. I don't like to have a whole lot of overhead. I don't hold, I don't do a lot of overspending. It's kind of the anti Eric Bischoff defense where it's not like this is Turner broadcasting, which was, I'm listening to the book for by guy Evans on nitro again, as this is all going on, honestly, the changes that Nikon's making has made me want to go back to that book and listen to it again, because of all the things that were going on, the accounting issues, I'm into that part of the book now, like what is it? Part, uh, chapter 39, which really goes into the financials and the accounting issues that Turner Broadcasting had with WCW. Actually, no, I'm at the part where we're talking about the new uh, internet ventures. That's right. The uh, live audio broadcasts, the uh, webcasts and stuff early on in the uh, late 90s. So the changes being made are necessary. They have to do this. And I don't mind that this direction is being taken. And I'm sure there are other people who are going to feel the same way. That they're going to feel different. The podcast brethren out there, my wrestling podcast brethren, I'm sure they might not understand the whole steps here. For me, it's not like I've been in some major programming thing, but I've been programming radio and podcasting for six, you know, 16 years. It was part in the in a lower level as a senior, you know, producing on a certain level, and then in 2010, it was going to be 2009 was when I actually started managing two online radio podcast networks. And I've been doing that ever since. So with that said, the changes being made here, we had to go and go forward and we had to make some things happen where we had extra staff. We were spending a lot. I did my part underneath the leadership to cut costs, to micromanage, to try to get things down to a point where when we had to go on the road, the level of equipment, shipping it out and the cost of everything being brought down to the bone. Why I did it is because I wanted to make sure my paycheck was covered and that we didn't have this overspending across the board that was unnecessary. Now there's going to be spending on the television level, on the product level, but it doesn't mean that the staff and the, the, the executives and the people in Titan Towers need to do that. They're also changing the making their, they're putting a lot of spending when it comes to going from one building to the other for their executive buildings in Stanford, Connecticut. Then you have, there's a lot of things that are going on here that have to be understood that we don't know all about. I'm sure I'm not, and I can't speak for anybody else as to what they're going to plan to do. But the plans being put into place, we're seeing it over the last month, and there's going to be more. I don't have any doubt about that. Because then what's going to have to happen is they're going to have to deal with the creative problems. Mr. Tito at NoDQ.com is talking about that. And a, a quite an interesting article he puts out. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I will link to it. Go look for it, wrestlingisreal.com. Wrestlingisreal.com, of course. So in the story, he writes that WWE Creative has ruined lives and caused unemployment for many wrestlers. So one of the questions he was asked about was the 2020 and 2021 April 15th releases of WWE Talents. The question was asked about all these talent releases for the past few decades and the fact that WWE Creative had nothing for them to do. And he talked about how they can go back to the Attitude Era or review the many great talents of WCW after it folded, ECW after it folded, or Ohio Valley Wrestling or, w, or Florida Championship Wrestling, and how they handed the WWE on a silver platter only for Stephanie McMahon, the Stephanie McMahon-led creative team with failed Hollywood writers to mow down. Since late 2013, Triple H became executive vice president of creative. He didn't fare much better, even with the talents that he personally groomed and recruited. He says here, quote, the WWE creative team has destroyed careers, he cap puts in caps, of pro wrestlers. And because a wrestler struggles to interpret a poorly written script, struggles to cut a promo from a bad script, somehow gets on the side of a bad writer or Vince, or can get outright buried by creative, they're the only ones unemployed. He goes through some of the wrestlers. And then he also comes down to say that the creative team is causing unemployment of WWE wrestlers thanks to their terrible booking ideas. On top of that, Vince McMahon is out of touch with creative at the tender age of 75, about to turn 76. Why on earth is that guy on the freaking road and forcing script rewrites just two hours before showtime? Kevin Dunn is Vince's best friend and controls the television product, has a ton to say and has been louder since Vince Russo left during the fall of 99. 
Then you have Triple H. The fact that Vince is his father-in-law, he's been a very popular and successful WWE superstar. Very wealthy. That has to stick up for his NXT talent who are called up to the main roster, he says. Vince and the creative team are mowing through some good wrestlers. And come on, Bruce Pritchard. He's a Vince Mark and a total enabler of Vince's bad ideas as also disabling the rest of the creative team for presenting anything worthwhile out of fear that it will upset Vince. He says the decline of pro wrestling is very simple to explain. And he goes through, and I'll read through a little bit of this. You had sharp-minded executives when wrestling grew like Eric Bischoff before his ego exploded before during November 96 when he joined the NWO as a cast member. Vince was surrounded by a superior management group of Pat Patterson, Jim Ross, Vince Russo, Jim Cornette briefly, and Gerald Briscoe. Bischoff blurred his lines between being on air and a company manager, and WCW was then dead. What is failing all of those wrestlers who were cut these last years is the awful management infrastructure. Talent relations, talent relations has not been the same since Jim Ross was demoted from it during 2004. Creative was seriously led by Stephen McMahon from 2000, the late 2000 to late 2013. Mentioning that she wrote for four hours of television and 13 years later, and they've lost two to three million viewers in the process. Well, that was going to happen with cable anyway. Keep that in mind. Triple H takes over in 2013. Another two million viewers lost. There was still going to be a declining of viewership on cable, period. Let's just know that for sure. But it could have been avoided. We all know that. So now, Bruce Pritchard is now overseeing creative. It's a Vince Enabler, worse than his family. Now, he obviously, uh, Mr. Tito's probably gotten a lot of flack from his uh, readers, and that's okay. He also says that Creative and the management staff of total yes men, family and corporate types of the enemies of the pro wrestling business, period in this story. Well, what do you think's happening right now? The yes men are getting pulled away. The capitulators, the ones that have been stayed loyal to Vince have done well. Those people are going away. The ineffective people I feel like Nikon is trying to remove. He is trying to bring in people that he knows will work. And work hard. It's kind of the Michael Ovitz feeling, which, you know, to, to the credit, Michael Ovitz, who created Creative Artist Agency. If you have not read the book of Who is Michael Ovitz, y- you have to. The Creative Artists Agency story, this is a group that completely revolutionized the way talent agents work in television and movies overall, and sports, where this company was able to go ahead and become the juggernaut that disrupted every other major talent agency in Hollywood to become the number one talent agency in the world, basically. I don't have to go and tell you all the things that they've been doing and what they've changed. Now, he also makes a mention of the AEW has the same problem. Tony Khan, who's very inexperienced himself, has surrounded himself with younger wrestlers as his executive vice president. They have zero experience as managers of a company and lack skills in recruiting, coaching, and motivating talent to succeed. The end result is Dynamite on a TNT channel that has 85 million households viewing and draws less than 1 million fans consistently since it began during the fall of 2019. You know, okay, got it. But changing the dynamic and, you know, the fact that WWE right now is they don't have to make these changes. They could have gone along status quo and Nick Khan could have done that, but he's not. I actually like the changes because he actually cares. He wants this to be a success story. Imagine if Nick Khan is the one out of everything else he's done in the sports division, he's able to go ahead and elevate a franchise a league like world wrestling entertainment legitimizing wrestling make it to the level of ufc 
what he's done already was he has presented and pitched the brand to the major broadcasters, to two major media entities, two of the top five, okay? He got the Fox deal done, which is now underneath Disney. He got the NBC Universal deal and even extended it more now with Peacock. That's all him. But he can't just make the deals, and this is where it has to be coming down for Vince, the understanding. Vince, I brought you these deals. We open these relationships. Now, you, thank you, you created the nucleus. You created what is the legacy of this company today. And that's the reason I was able to sell it. But then I took the best of what this company has done. And now we have to deliver on not just our legacy, which is what Peacock's going to benefit from, and some others, the A&E documentaries we can talk about. We have to create the product that has to go ahead and stay at the level of what has been brought in previous. So it's time to elevate all that. So at the least, they're going to be able to make sure the organizational structure in the corporate end, it's being done. Digital. Making all those changes there. Talent religious, talent relations, making those changes there as well. Because when it comes to talent relations, that's the pipeline to get them into the NXT Performance Center and go along. So that's fine. When it comes to the changes in the digital end and some of the corporate people that he took away, publicity, communications, the changes he made it there, because he's going to bring in new people that are going to have they're they're going to just come in with fresh ideas. They're going to be able to go and promote the brand to the corporate and business to business and business to consumer to advertisers to everybody else. They're going to have people that, regardless of the resume, they're going to be people that are going to work for Nick Khan. And Nick Khan must have a vision of what this company is going to be under his leadership which I have to feel like Vince at his age has to understand he has to pull back. I said on a TikTok video that the shareholders need to make him chairman emeritus. He needs to be put into a semi-retired role in this company. Let him allow him to continue to be overseeing the product. One of the things that did not help much was the XFL, which that was actually something he was pulled away from. But then now that he's brought back, you know, I think the XFL might have affected him somewhat, might have taken a shot to his ego because it was working right. What a damn good idea. XFL, and I'm so glad that's going to be coming back. But that was a good idea, and he really had his uh, himself all embedded into that right then and there. And that was working well. And I really feel like we could have waited for some changes from Paul Heyman, and if Eric Bischoff wasn't working, we could have worked for somebody else. The whole Bruce Pritchard idea, once the XFL was gone, you notice that the timing was where Bruce Pritchard got inserted in, brought back, which I don't know why he was brought back. Well, we know it was because that was a replacement for Eric Bischoff, but still, those changes happened right after the XFL, and Vince had to go and unload it. And that's what he did. So Vince had, you know, he didn't have the XFL that he was really working on, being motivated to work on. So he went back to his baby. But he just, to go ahead and be disconnected away from there and come back in and feel like, well, I can do the same thing I've done before and just try to hit pay dirt again. Try to hit pay dirt one more time. We're not talking about Shelton Benjamin's finisher. Let's figure out what it's going to be. And they just don't get what we can, it can become. Just not sure. And it's too bad. But the changes being made as I close out this portion, we have to understand that all the changes that need to be necessary to get this company back on board, if the company is going to be able to go and right the wrongs themselves, which I think Nick Khan is making the best possible effort to do, I still will say that Vince will be motivated by competition. 
we can see what double or nothing double or nothing is going to look like for AEW coming up this weekend. We'll talk about that coming up in a minute. But for Vince being pushed by competition, even the company had to make the changes with the house shows, getting them back on board, getting the shows back on the road. I think that move is also a Nick Khan move. Let's get ourselves back on the road. We have to respond because AEW is moving forward and AEW needs to be looked at. So I think Nick Khan and his team, they're taking notice. Vince might not so much, but this corporate team, they had to do something. So they decided, let's go ahead and announce the dates. Let's get things rolling. Let's get ourselves back on the road in July. And I can appreciate doing that it's going to definitely help the audience going back out on the road and for this audience there will be a little bit of a renewed interest in this in the product because the live fans will now begin get the chance to respond as they've been wanting to for a long time that's going to help out when it comes to the ratings a little bit i think we're going to see a spike when the new live crowds come back i don't see how it doesn't like getting away from that Thunderdome is going to be a welcome relief, at least in my eyes anyway. Let's go and move along to AEW's Double or Nothing coming up this weekend. Uh, I'll make a quick point and say, you know, uh, to Larry Steve, I think it was, that's the name of the pig that Alexa Bliss had been raising for a number of years that passed away. And I saw on Instagram that Alexa Bliss was actually very shaken up by it, so respects and condolences and best wishes for her and her family. You know, losing a pet is not fun. I can't relate, but I can understand why it would hurt her so much. So that's unfortunate. And that's why she was not on TV this week. So hopefully, you know, there's a way to come around that struggle and find a way to work a way around it. And just as with any kind of uh, loss, you know, it's all we can do is just kind of pick ourselves back up again. That's where we are. So that's going to talk about AW Double or Nothing coming up this weekend. Quite a, quite a show they're going to have already set up. And I mean, everything's pretty much been announced for what they're going to be doing this weekend as well, which is good. All right, start off, we have the Casino Battle Royale. Royale and Paul White will be on commentary for that match. We have 20... Wrestlers that will be part of the match will be Christian Cage, Matt Seidel, Powerhouse Hobbs, Evil Uno, Cole Cabana, Jungle Boy, Isaiah Cassidy, Mark Quinn, Matt Hardy, Griff Garrison, Brian Pimble Jr., QT Marshall, Penta El Cedo Miedo, Nick Camarado, Max Castor, Anthony Bowens, The Blade, Preston Vance, or 10, Lee Johnson, and Dustin Rhodes. And out of that match... I will go ahead and pick Christian Cage to win the Battle Royale because I think that's going to be where they want to give Christian Cage that one shot and they're going to probably try to elevate him on a push at some point. Why not this match? Or at least we'll know that he'll probably last pretty long overall. Hangman Page versus Brian Cage. That's a pretty interesting match. I don't know if the MLW, the FTW World title will be on the line, but I'm going to say Hangman Page continues to win. And at what point do you say Hamman Page could be somebody that would be another that could be down the line an opponent for Kenny Omega? I think we'd love to go and see that. And maybe that's somewhere down the line we're going to get to a program with him. But that's what I also like with AC, the AEW is that they have this going on right now, and we can actually we have multiple possible opponents for. Kenny Omega and that world title, which is nice. I would just like to see if Hangman Page got a chance to get closer to it at some point. Cody Rose versus Anthony Gogo. Cody will probably win that match. AW Tag Team Titles. Young Bucks versus Eddie Kingston and John Moxley. Hey, yo, man, that's a tough match to pick. I'm going to pick Eddie Kingston and John Moxley to upset. I think they'll beat the Bucks. I don't know. That's It's not easy, but I kind of feel like that's where we, work, we go with that. The NWA women's title will be on the line. Serena Deeb defending against Riho. 
and I think that Riho will win the NWA world title or women's title. You got Stadium Stampede, Inner Circle versus the Pinnacle. And, man, could the Pinnacle, well, I mean, I think the Pinnacle's going to win. Chris Jericho still got a bad arm, bad a bad wing, so I don't know if he can actually come through it. Just by that, I think Pinnacle will win the Stadium Stampede. But I hope it looks like it'll be pretty fun. I'm looking forward to that. TNT Championship, Miro, the new champion versus Lance Archer. And I can see where transition could have a transitional championship could be right here for Miro. So I can see Lance Archer winning. Kind of gave him the, t- the title. I think we could see that happen. AEW Women's World Championship, Carl Sheeta versus Britt Baker. I'm looking forward to this. And I think Britt Baker will then take the belt off of Hikaru Shidi. The, the build up for Britt Baker just makes sense. Dr. Britt Baker, DMD. Britt wins. Britt will win the championship. Sting and Darby Allen versus Scorpio Sky and Ethan Page. And I'll take Sting and Darby Allen. But a very good, interesting match. And finally, Kenny Omega and a triple threat versus Pac versus Orange Cassidy. AW World title. Omega's winning. He retains. And then I look forward to seeing Omega defending both champions or defending the Impact World title later on against Moose at against all outs. That's where I think things are going. So I like all that. Overall, it's good. And we'll just leave it there. We are going to be doing a post show for Double or Nothing this weekend. The show is Sunday night. And that is great. I'm looking forward to it. We'll talk all about that coming up. It's 8 o'clock start time. Come back right here to WrestlingIsReal.com. We'll go ahead and talk all about it and leave it all there. And I'll put the show out a little bit short, a little less than an hour this week. And we'll come back this weekend. Talk about Double or Nothing. Recap it, which is going to be great here on the Wrestling Is Real podcast. Because wrestling needs us thank you for listening to the wrestling is real podcast you can find all previous episodes at wrestlingisreal.com or subscribe to the show on all major podcast outlets including apple amazon google spotify and iHeartRadio. follow the king of podcasts on twitter facebook and instagram at king of podcasts and search king of podcasts on youtube or type youtube.com slash jbrasco951. This has been a presentation of the King of Podcasts Radio Network.